I'm Amitabh Mattu. I'm the director of the Australia India Institute and a professor of international relations. As many of you are aware, the Australia India Institute is attempting or has been attempting over the last few years to build in Australia a capacity to understand India through its teaching, research, public policy, and outreach programs. We're also helping to foster a dialogue between India and Australia, between Indians and Australians, between Indian institutions and Australian institutions. Our annual oration brings global thought leaders to Melbourne to speak about issues that matter. In the past, we have had the Vice Chancellor of this university, Shashi Tharoor, a minister with the Indian government, deliver our orations. Today, it's a great honor for us to have arguably India's greatest thought leader, Nandan Nilikini, a great entrepreneur, and someone who's really, through his personal life and work, transforming India. I also want to acknowledge, before I formally introduce Nandan, the presence of the High Commissioner, Mr. Birananda, and Mrs. Nilikini, and our Chair, Robert Johansson. Nandan Nilikini, as all of you know, was one of the founders of Infosys, uh, India's third largest IT company today, but also in his new role as the chairman of the UAID is, is attempting to give every Indian a unique biometric identity. But more importantly, or no less importantly, the Nilikinis have used their time over the last decade and a half to help create radical social change in India through their philanthropic activities. Nandan personally has contributed $5 million to IIT Bombay, his, al his alma mater, another $5 million to Yale for their Yale India initiative, and arguably today Yale India initiative has made Yale uh, academically the center of excellence for India. He's contributed another $5 million to the Institute of Human Settlements in Bangalore, which is soon going to be a deemed university. And Rohini has contributed more than $50 million to various uh, social causes, uh, including ones that relate to the environment, water, education, and is continuing to do so uh, even as we speak. So ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to have the Nilinkilis visit Australia. They're going to travel to Sydney after this and then to Melbourne, and then to Canberra. But more importantly, they're here to give, Mr. Nandan Nilikiri is here to deliver the AII annual oration. May I request Nandan to come on the stage, please? Uh, I'll speak about uh, technology and its role in uh, India's transformation. And uh, I think many, many people are familiar with the Indian uh, software export story. Today, uh, India exports more than uh, $50 billion of uh, IT and software exports around the world. And, the, and really, it has transformed India, created millions of jobs, and established India in that space. Uh, but what I'm talking about today is really more, is not so much what we do on the exports, but how technology can be used as an instrument uh, for transformation of a society. Uh, I think one of the things about information technology is that it's uh, ubiquitous, it's cheap, uh, and it, 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 it improves very fast. And in some sense, uh, India or other developing countries have an opportunity to take advantage of this in ways that we could not take advantage of in the previous industrial revolutions. Now, there are many definitions of an industrial revolution, but the one I use is the one by an economist at Northwestern called Robert Gordon who said basically there have been three industrial revolutions. The first was between 1750 and 1830, which was the rise of uh, the steam, steam engines, uh, locomotives, the railways, and, and the telegraph. And the second industrial revolution, as per his definition, was between uh, 1870 to 1900, which was the rise of electricity, the internal combustion engine, indoor plumbing, and water, uh, communications, chemicals, plastics, and a whole host of things that came about in that era. And in his definition, the third industrial revolution is the one of computers, the web, smartphones, and all the things that we see here. 
Now, in some sense, when the first two industrial revolutions happened, India was not an independent country, and therefore didn't really fully, was not able to leverage those revolutions. But this third industrial revolution of technology, information technology, is happening at a time when the country is free, and therefore it, it is something that can be uniquely used uh, for development. There are also certain other things about this uh, uh, technology that make it uh, very, very viable. As I said, thanks to Moore's law, computing power is becoming you know, cheaper and cheaper and more and more powerful day by day. The computer in your smartphone is, is, is equal to in power to the computer which was there in the, in, in, in the space programs. So you can see that things are becoming more and more powerful and more and more uh, accessible to everybody. So this is, you can think of this as the rise of ubiquitous uh, computing where everybody can have a device in their hand, which is a smart device, a phone or a tablet. This is an era where you have in, in, inexhaustible amounts of computing storage and uh, space on the cloud, which you can access. And all of you do that with your various uh, Dropbox and Google Drive and all that. And then, of course, you, are, you have an era of ubiquitous connectivity, where everybody is on the network. Now, India has seen the first uh, you know, sort of avalanche of that with the mobile phone. And uh, the, the mobile phone in India has been a huge revolution. Uh, today, in, Indians have about 600 to 700 million mobile phones. Uh, mobile phone tariffs in India are among the cheapest in the world. And there's been a huge amount of innovation which has put connectivity into the hands of everyone so they can make basic voice calls. And in fact, there's a great book by Robin Jeffries and his colleague uh, called Cell Phone Nation, which describes how India has adopted to the, to the whole cell phone era. But going beyond the cell phone, I think we are on the verge of another kind of revolution. Because if you think about this technology, which is available, available ubiquitously, cheaply, and, and, and you know, the broadband connectivity and all that, it fundamentally provides ways to look at development that we think can be used to leapfrog uh, you know, how, we, how we bring change together. And in some sense, the project which I lead today, which is called as the uh, Unique Identification Authority of India, or the Aadha project, is one such example of how we are using this modern technology to leapfrog. So what is, what is the problem that we are trying to solve in the UID, or the Aadha program? Aadha stands for foundation. Uh, and what we're basically trying to solve is the problem of people not having uh, an acknowledgment of their existence by, by people and by the state, or lack of acknowledgment of their identity. Now, this is not a problem in Western countries or in Australia, because in, in, in developed countries, when, when a baby is born, uh, they almost automatically get a birth certificate. Uh, today, in, in Western countries, uh, the birth registration rates are about 98 to 99 percent. And so when a baby is born, they get a birth certificate. The birth certificate uniquely identifies the baby. And that birth certificate then becomes the basis for a lot of other documents. It becomes the basis for citizenship, for the passport, for a driver's license. So fundamentally, if you have a good birth registration system, then it solves the identity problem for uh, all the people who are getting born. However, in India, and it's also common to many other developing countries, uh, there are parts of this country where actually a lot of births are not registered. And in, in there are some states of India where more than half the births are not registered at the time of birth. Now, what this does is you end up with a lot of people growing up without any identity document about themselves. And the documents that we take for granted, like a passport or a driver's license, are actually there with very few people. You know, in Indian, out of India's population of you know, 1.1, 1.2 billion people, uh, something like only 50 million people have passports, which is only 5% of the population. Uh, only something like 30 million pay taxes, which is 3% of the population. Maybe 150 million have driver's licenses, which is about 15% of the population. So fundamentally, all these traditional things which we take for granted as identity are really there for a very narrow uh, part of the population. And they have this huge you know, mass of people who don't often have an ID. Now, historically, this was not a real problem because if you lived all your life in a village and everybody knew your name, you know, like the, the Cheers pub, uh, it didn't really matter. But in a modern society where people are mobile, they're aspirational, they're moving from rural India to urban India, from central India to coastal India, from north India to south India, they are moving around, they're searching for jobs, searching for their uh, aspirations and goals. Not having an identity is, is a huge uh, impediment. Because if you don't have a way of proving who you are, 
then you can't get a job, you can't get admission to school, you, can't, you know, somebody can stop you on the road and, and arrest you because you don't have any proof of who you are. So the whole host of disadvantages or impediments or, or obstacles uh, that come to people uh, who don't have an ID. So the government set up this program principally for two big reasons. One is to give everybody an ID so that they could participate, they could sort of become part of the formal economy. And in that sense, it's the world's largest social inclusion project. And uh, the purpose was also, the other part is that over the last 20 years, the Indian, uh, 15 years, the Indian government has been rolling out a welfare state. It's been rolling out various schemes for uh, employment, for health, for education, for uh, pensions and scholarships and all kinds of things to really build a welfare state, which, which, which uh, other countries did much earlier. And so as they rolled out this welfare state, they realized that the, their expenditure on entitlements and subsidies was really going up tremendously. And today, the Indian government spends something like over $60 billion a year on entitlements and, and subsidies. And more, all these entitlement subsidies go to individuals. And as, as they started rolling out this program, they realized that unless the underlying identity of an individual was, was securely identifiable, you really had a challenge of the quality or the list of beneficiaries for any public program. In other words, if you didn't really have a proper ID system, then you could have lots of ghosts and duplicates in every beneficiary database. And there's enough evidence now to show that in most of these databases, there could be anywhere from 10, 20% of ghosts and duplicates. And that obviously means that that much money was not reaching the real beneficiaries. So these were the two big reasons why this project was undertaken, which was to give every Indian uh, a unique ID and to give uh, uh, the government a way to make sure that its delivery of entitlements and subsidies was much more efficient, equitable, and effective. Now, when we looked at this, doing this project, which we began four years back, we said, how do we do it? And how do we leverage modern technology to, to solve this problem? Now, one of the challenges we have is we wanted to make sure that everybody had a unique ID. Now, unique ID meant that a person had to have only one ID, and one ID had to map to only one person. So you had to have a one is to one link between a person and, and the number that was assigned to him. And you know, if everybody had a birth certificate, it was not a big deal. We just take the birth certificate and convert that into an ID. But what do you do when you have so many people without birth certificates? And how do you ensure that a person has only one ID. And we came to the conclusion that the best way to do that was by using the biometrics. Now, biometrics in, in the Western world has been used for other purposes, like you know, it's used as a security measure and so on. But we have actually taken the technology of biometrics, which, which has been developed globally for other reasons, and made it as the platform for uh, uh, establishing uniqueness. So what we really do is that anybody who enrolls into our system uh, we have their uh, biometrics, which is the fingerprints and the iris of, the, of every person. And that, we think, gives a unique sort of signature for every individual. And then whenever en anybody enrolls into our system, even if they claim to be enrolling for the first time, we check that data against all the people's uh, biometrics that we have to check whether it's a duplicate or not. So that's essentially, it's a very simple thing. You enroll, you check for duplication. If you're a duplicate, we reject it. If you're not a duplicate, you're a new person entering the system, we assign a unique number to you. And that's how we create this whole, whole unique ID system. And this, but this is really a problem of scale. So since we started this project about four and a half years back, and since then we have, uh, we rolled out about three years back. And in three years, we have enrolled 500 million people into our system. So 500 million uh, Indian residents have been enrolled into our system. And 450 million of them have been issued the unique ID or the Aadhaar number. So we have an ability to enroll and generate 1 million Aadhaars a day. And in the month of September, we were able to do 25 million Aadhaars just in September. Now. Think of it, think of the, how it has to be done, right? Let's say that today we have 450 million uh, you know, records in our, in our database, and a million new people come. Each of those million has to be compared against all 450 million on every attribute to establish whether it's a duplicate or not. And that requires several trillion matches every night. So what we have built is the world's largest sort of uh, network 
of massively parallel processing computers using standardized microprocessor technology and Linux and all these open source tools. And we process a million records a day and compare them against all the records we have, and then we decide whether the person is a duplicate or not. So it's, it's really a, a massive project. But this was only possible because of the advances in, in technology. We could not have done this project even five years back. But now with massive, you know, you can put massive computers all, all connected together. You can use the, the Linux kind of uh, infrastructure. And what the internet has done is the internet companies have had to develop large systems for handling large amounts of data. So if you go to a Facebook today, a Facebook has a billion users who are all posting pictures and videos and all kinds of things onto the, onto the social networking site. Or you go to Google YouTube, they're giving out a hundred a billion views of videos all the time. So what has happened, because the internet has become so pervasive and because every internet organization has, has you know, a billion users or a billion uh, page views or whatever, the internet technology has now made it possible to think of using exactly that same infrastructure, but in a different way to give everybody a, a unique ID. So the entire platform that we developed uses the latest internet technology and uses this open source kind of products which are out there. So using this, we generate this unique ID for everyone. But it's not just about giving a, a unique ID. It's about creating a software platform which allows us to build all kinds of applications on top of this unique ID. Now here again, the concept of platforms is well understood in the technology world, right? When, you know, when, when Microsoft and Intel came together, they created essentially a platform for PCs. And if you look at what happened in the PC world, you know, Intel would develop the chip, Microsoft would develop the operating system, Dell or Compaq would build the PC, and around the world we had a huge revolution of personal computing. And that same ecosystem has now developed in the era of smartphones or tablets, where again, you know, ARM develops the chip. Uh, chip is licensed to a chip manufacturer, uh, MediaTek in China or Qualcomm in, in the US. Uh, you know, Google or uh, open source software vendor provides the operating system like Android. Uh, somebody in China or India or Australia makes, makes a tablet. And that's how this whole thing has, 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 has blossomed. So all over the world, technology has been like an ecosystem approach where people bring together things from different suppliers and, and create product. So we said, is there a way to think about identity as a, as a platform on which we can build applications? So we said that our mandate is just to give an ID. It's not to build the application. This is an important distinction that you need to make because when a driver's you know, when a, uh, the transport authority issues a driver's license, it actually is doing two things. It's issuing an ID, because you show, you, show, you show it when you go to the bar to show you're an adult, but it's actually a permission to drive on the road because that, that driver's license is saying that he has been tested and he's now eligible to drive on the road. Or a passport is an ID document, but it's also a document that entitles you to travel abroad or as, as a citizen of the country who has issued your passport. So most ID uh, documents have a dual purpose. They, they are both an ID as well as a, an app application. What we said is, is there a way to sort of split the ID from its application and create a simple ID platform which identifies a person and says that he or she is the person they claim to be, and then let different application providers build the application on top of it. So it's, think of it as a layering or a slicing of identity from its, from its application. And therefore, our ID system does not really, it's not an application, it just says X is X, says John is John, or Ram is Ram, or Akbar is Akbar, or Anthony is Anthony. It doesn't say whether Anthony or Akbar or Ram or John is a citizen. It doesn't say whether they're eligible for getting some entitlements. It doesn't say whether they're eligible to drive, none of those things. It just provides a proof of identity and a proof of address. And then we allow this identity and address to participate in different applications of its use. And this is, you can think of this as a layering of the way we solve the problem. So what happens then is, let's say that the, the passport system wants to use this. The passport system will continue to issue passports and, and go through all the police verification and all the other things that you know, the passport authorities do. But for the purpose of ID verification, they can use this particular ID platform. Or suppose you are a bank, 
and the bank wants to allow someone to withdraw money in a remote village uh, using uh, an agent, then you can use this platform to verify identity before dispensing the cash. So this splitting of identity from its applications is the, is the fundamental architectural difference in the way that we have solved this issue. And what this does, it allows any, any user who's, who's authorized to build applications which involve identity and use that to build new kinds of applications. So this is, in some sense, an ecosystem that allows you to build innovative applications. And to sort of, sort of understand this, I think the best example we have is the GPS, or the Global Positioning System, which was, as you know, the Global Positioning System was, was designed uh, at the height of the Star Wars thing. It was part of the uh, US-Soviet kind of military Cold War and all that. And the Americans developed the GPS, which was really a network of global geostationary satellites, which could triangulate an exact point on the, on the, on the world. So it, it had the latitude and longitude of every point. So you could, you could go somewhere and it'll tell you the exact latitude and longitude. And the reason they developed this technology was really for, for missile guidance. You wanted to you know, uh, sort of take a missile and exactly hit a particular target, then you needed to tr tell the missile exactly where to go. And therefore, you needed to know the latitude and longitude of the target. So the GPS was developed with that intention in mind. And you know, it's a very sophisticated system. But sometime in the year 2000, the GPS was put in the public domain for other people to build applications. So it was put out when President Clinton was in, in the office. They made it uh, commercially available. And when the GPS became commercially available, suddenly there was a whole host of innovative applications that came around it. So today, you, know, you use your TomTom or Gammon or one of your car navigating systems, or you use Google Maps on your phone, or you use inertial navigating systems in planes, or you use location-based services like Foursquare, all of the, or self-driving cars, all these products ultimately are based on the GPS because they're all based on answering the question, where am I? And therefore, a technology that was originally conceived for military purposes, put in the commercial domain, and put as an open platform, allowed all kinds of innovation to happen uh, on top of it. So, and all that GPS fundamentally did was answer the question, where am I? And so we are saying, if, if we can build an ID system which answers the question, who am I, and make that available as an open platform, then we'll see a lot of applications surrounding it which will use this ID verification. And over time, you'll have a richer and richer ecosystem of applications which will help you to transform a society in a big way. So that's the thinking that we have brought to this project. And this is really an example of how today's technology makes it possible. The fact that you can store records of a billion people in the cloud, the fact that connectivity is ubiquitous, the fact that everywhere you can have a device of some kind, all this suddenly opens up new degrees of leverage, or new, new capabilities that we can use for, for doing this. Now, so when we build the ID system, we said let's use the ID for applications. So we said we must build a few applications ourselves or work with our partners to show how it works. So the first big application that we have is the ability to use this ID for direct cash transfers or direct benefit transfers. And what we have done is we have linked, we have provided the ability for a person to link their bank account to the ID. So think of it this way that let's say your ID is one, two, three and you have a bank account in you know, the State Bank of India, which is India's largest bank, then you can go to the bank and say, link my ADA number to my bank account. And when you do that link, somewhere in the cloud, somewhere in a secure place, this link is maintained, saying ADA number 123 points to SBI. Now what happens is, if the government, for example, wants to send that person a pension, the government, first of all, make sure that everybody in the pension list has an Aadhaar number, which removes all ghosts and duplicates and make sure they're only genuine people. It just says, send 1,000 rupees to Aadhaar number 123. And somewhere up there in the cloud, the Aadhaar number 123 maps to SBI. The 1,000 rupee credit is sent to SBI. SBI knows that Aadhaar number 123's bank account is bank account number 789 and does an electronic credit. This is what is called as state through processing. There's no, there's no human intervention in this. 
So essentially what this means is that every person who has an Aadhaar number in theory can get money directly into his bank account just by using his identity number. In this particular thing, the Aadhaar number acts as a financial address. So just like you have an account number, the Aadhaar number is a proxy for that and allows you to credit. And using this me mechanism, uh, the government is actually now rolling out a direct benefit transfer system. And today we have about, out of the total 450 million Aadhaar issued, we have about 30 million Aadhaar linked bank accounts, where the link is there between the bank account and the Aadhaar number. And we have done over 10 million transactions where cash has been electronically credited to somebody's account using the Aadhaar number as the financial key, the address. So this is again how you can use this now to, so in, in effect we're building probably the world's largest direct benefit transfer system where anyone with an Aadhaar number can be automatically credited money directly and, and, and seamlessly into the bank account. And then the other important thing is when ID systems were developed uh, in, in, in the West, uh, they were developed before the technology era. For example, if you look at the US, the US developed the social security system in the 1930s when, you know, if you remember, there was a great depression and Roosevelt was the uh, president and he had the New Deal. And one of the part of the New Deal was social security pensions called as the Social Security Administration, which, which was set up in the 1930s. And as part of that, they had to have a way of identifying beneficiaries who retired and could claim their pensions. And that was called, and therefore everybody was given a number called the social security number. And similar other numbers have happened. I'm sure in Australia, in the UK, you had the national insurance number. In, in Sweden, you have the personal identification number. So countries came up with numbering systems uh, for handling their pensions. But they were done in a pre-digital era, so they were not really electronic. Since we are designing a ID system in a post-digital world, we made sure that this is an online ID. It's not just a number, but it's an online verifiable number. And what, what we mean by that is that if somebody goes somewhere and says, I'm X and my number is one, two, three, we provide an online way of verifying that he indeed is X. So he goes somewhere, he says, I'm John, my number is one, two, three, here's my fingerprint. We send that information li uh, in real time to our system and reply saying, yes, the person standing there is John. So it's, it's an identity verification system. So what this does is that wherever you're providing services, you can do ID verification. So, so suppose you go to claim your, your pension, it'll verify who you are. Or you, you go somewhere to you know, get your entitlement of rice and wheat, you can verify who you are. So this ability to do online verification of identity is the key to building all kinds of applications that change the way public service delivery is done. And we also, this ID, ID is also available as a KYC or a know your customer. I mean, if you, if you know what's happening in, in the banking sector, many of you are from the banking sector, one of the big requirements is verifying whether the customer is, is a real person. So this process is called know your customer. And this know your customer business has become much more stringent after 9-11 because of international regulations, the, you know, uh, the Financial Action Task Force, prevention of money laundering, anti-money laundering, all kinds of laws have come which require verification of identity has become a big thing. And fortunately for us, in India, the regulator has said this Aadha number, the proof of identity and proof of address it provides, is sufficient KYC to open a bank account. So now, this also therefore addresses the issue of financial inclusion, because somebody can go anywhere in the country where there's an electronic device, authenticate, authorize his bank account opening and open an instant bank account. So that means you, you're getting access to services and using this technology, I can open an instant bank account, an insur instant insurance policy, an instant mobile connection and all kinds of things. So this is therefore how just a simple concept of a number gives you so, so much uh, flexibility. Now why is this important? Because using these tools, using these ca capabilities, you can transform the way you deliver things. For example, when we do direct benefit transfer, we are transferring money directly into people's bank account. That removes so many things in the chain and makes it so much more efficient, make sure money reaches the right person, make sure they can withdraw it from anywhere. So you can transform the way you deliver financial benefits. You can transform the way you deliver non-financial benefits. You can transform the way people get access. Today in India, you still have a large number of people who don't have bank accounts. 
Part of the reason they don't have bank accounts is that there's no way to verify their identity. Part of the reason they don't have bank accounts is that most of the banking services are in urban areas or large villages, but in 600,000 villages, many of them don't have any access to banking services. So tomorrow, you can have an agent in that village who has an electronic mobile phone-based device which can open the account and allow you to transact business. It allows you to withdraw cash and deposit cash. So suddenly, using technology, you can take something which is very far away and take it to a few hundred meters from every resident. So my point is that this is important because the, what, the, the revolution that is happening, the fact that this technology has become so uh, widespread and inexpensive, the fact that there's so much power where we can put all the information on the cloud, the fact that connectivity around the world is becoming ubiquitous. Originally, it was just voice connectivity. Now we're talking about broadband and internet. Uh, the fact that devices are becoming so inexpensive, I can get a you know, sort of smartphone today for less than $100. So all these things are, means that there's a whole new paradigm which is possible. And I believe, and, that, and that's what essentially is my work, is that you have a new paradigm which allows you to rethink the way you solve public problems. For example, you, you, know, so you can solve the healthcare problem by designing a next generation healthcare <laughs> record system which is linked to a unique ID which is kept on the cloud which only you can open so that your privacy is assured but that record travels with you wherever you go and therefore you can you know, have a mobile healthcare record and so on. So fundamentally, the, the work that we're doing is really sort of a larger strategic thing which is how do you address problems at scale? You know, we have to address the problems of a billion people. How do we address them at speed? Because you know, we can't spend 20 years solving these problems that we solve much faster because of a young, aspirational, impatient uh, you know, uh, cohorts. So how do we make it at scale, at speed? And the more I think about this, only using these kind of technology paradigms and the power that we have of these paradigms and thinking you know, from ground up on how these can be impacted can really be used for making change at scale. So I believe that while the, the first generation of India's technology was, was the success of spectacular success of exports and creating a global footprint of IT companies, the second stage was really the mobile phone. The third stage will be really using these modern technologies to transform basic things like financial inclusion, like, like welfare benefits, like education, like healthcare, like, uh, you know, and all these things. And that is the way I think we can fix problems at scale and speed and really make a difference to our society. Thank you very much. So we have some time for uh, questions. I think um, there's a microphone. Well, thank you very much for that interesting talk. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, be the devil's advocate here. Uh, what's the downside to all of this? Well, a number of possible things. One is that, obviously, it's, it's very complex to pull off. And therefore, you have to make sure at all times that you're on, you know, you're doing the right thing and, and so on. The second is that in any large system, the flip side of using extensive technology is that you also have issues of privacy and security, which, which we have seen everywhere around the world. And therefore, you have to make sure that you design it to be secure, design it to be private, build privacy into the, into the architecture. So I think those are the, some of the things. The third thing I would say is uh, it's obviously not a panacea for everything. I'm, I'm not saying that this, you have to solve all fundamental problems at the same time, and it doesn't solve deep-rooted social inequities. But you can definitely use it, and so you shouldn't get caught into the belief that this will solve everything. But definitely, I think there's a class of problems. Delivering benefits to people, uh, providing mobile identity, uh, providing uh, you know, electronic uh, cash transfer, uh, providing instant access to public services. All these things are eminently solvable using technology at scale. Do you think there is inadequate understanding within the system because the court has not been very appreciative? Even in the cabinet, they could not distinguish between the national population register and the other. No, I think, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, a, a technology like this, which is, where there's no precedent really, 
this, I mean, you can't say this is the way it is somewhere else because it's it's obviously in, you know leading edge in that sense. Uh, the full 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 understanding of that will take time. I mean, I mean, I don't think you know if, if, if ten years back, if if I, if you had, somebody had said that. 700 million people in India will have mobile phones. You would have said, oh, no, that's not possible. Or even eight years back, if you had said that smartphones and tablets would, would overcome, you know, sort of take over the PC world, you, would, you, you wouldn't have been able to visualize what is that thing. But now it's happening around us. So I think uh, it, often with new advances, it's, 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 you know, some of the complexities or nuances uh, take time to diffuse. And that's true of all technology diffusion. I mean, I mean, electricity was invented in 1879. The first light bulb was lit up by Edison in 1879. But electricity became widespread only in the 1930s. So it takes 30, 40 years for technology to go from an idea or a, or a proof to rapid diffusion. So I think this diffusion will take time. But as it is, you know, I think the level of appreciation of what this is has gone up a lot. Now people understand cash transfers. I mean, it's just I think just doing it and showing it that creates depth of understanding. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Um, the technology is without question brilliant. And Indian ingenuity is also brilliant. So my question is, how does this system deal with the fairly entrenched practice of the Benami system? We saw with land sealing legislation in India, that clever farmers registered their land in the name of deceased relatives and even cows. So can your system overcome Benami? Well, you know, I think, as I said, we see ourselves as a platform provider. We're providing an identity platform with an open set of application programming interfaces and different users based on their perception of solving some problem can use that platform. So it's not, we are not the application provider, we are the platform provider. And certainly, if, if somebody in the future wants to use this for land records, then they can use it. And using the UID will, will ensure that land records are only genuine people. And therefore, we can solve the problem that way. But we, we are not really advocating which usage should happen, because we believe that as different agencies understand the, 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 the sort of the ability of this technology, then they'll figure out ways to use it. Right now, our focus is on a few big applications. Uh, uh, the one that is really the prime application that we're focusing on is direct benefit transfer. And the reason for that is very simple, that the original justification for this project was really to improve uh, the quality of public expenditure to make sure the real benefits reach the real people. So we have to make sure that works. But we believe that the savings from that itself pay for this infrastructure. And once you have this infrastructure, which is a public good, which is paid for by the savings, and then you can build all kinds of applications on top of that, which hopefully will happen in the coming years. Certainly, the application you mentioned is a possibility, but it, it, somebody has to pick up, pick up the ball on that and make it happen. Uh, Raman Singh from Monash University. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more that every new system has uh, lives its full potential only over a period of time. If somebody said 20 years ago something like this, nobody would believe in Indian context. So that part is uh, well understood, and I fully agree with that. Uh, the day when everybody in India will have a um, uh, unique uh, identity n uh, number, uh, do you think uh, that it will be helpful also in addressing some of the major problems of Indian development, that is accountability and corruption. That, that's my first question. I will come to second in a sec. Yeah, well, you know, I think the way to think about it is automatically when you use it for beneficiary lists, then your beneficiary list will be essentially now genuine beneficiaries because you'll remove ghosts and duplicates. So that's one form of, uh, you know, transparency that will come. Second is that because you can do a biometric authentication at the time of dispersal, you can make sure that only genuine beneficiaries withdraw it. For example, if you use it in a PDS, only the beneficiary can authenticate and take their rice or wheat, so that can't be diverted. That's the second example of how it will clean up. The third thing is that today, uh, in most systems, uh, 
a person who's getting a benefit like a pension or a scholarship or, a, or his rice goes only to one location to get it. They don't have a choice. They have to go to this shop or this person to get their benefits. Tomorrow, once you have the ID which provides mobility on the cloud, then you can build a system where I can go to any shop and get my benefits. So once you create a system where the, where the where you as the beneficiary or the customer can choose your outlet for, for getting a service, then the bargaining power shifts from the supplier to the, to the beneficiary. And therefore, if one particular supplier is not giving a good service, you can go to somebody else, just like you can go to some other shop if you don't get good service. So all that changes the bargaining power between supplier and beneficiary. And that in turn leads to, uh, you know, a much more accountable system. So there are a whole host of things. And then finally, we have end-to-end -end transparency of every transaction. So there's a whole host of things which, which will have a big impact on governance, accountability, and transparency. Thank you. Thank you for a very good lecture and also for putting India in the forefront and giving a very good technological platform for getting rid of the corruption from the country. But there are some very serious issue because uh, the, when it comes to governance and development, it is very important that every step is right and we basically, uh, there are some issues which are not addressed in this. And that is also in this, uh, you initially you have addressed the fact that you have changed a separated ID from the application. So you have provided some security and taking care of, assuming we can, te technical security, we can take care of the security. But the moment you start putting in applications there, this, this separation will not be there. Once this separation is not there, then all kind of crime can come in. We can also have totalitarian state and instead of actually developing, we may actually go backwards and we also can <coughs> jeopardize national security, all kinds of things. So one can get a totalitarian society and this issue has been faced by Western countries and other Marxist countries as well already and they've gone backwards because of it. Well, I mean, that's the point of view. Uh, I think uh, a lot of care has been taken in the design of this to really it's design it as something which is empowering, which is uh, designed for people. Uh, for example, the system doesn't collect data on anyone beyond the basic requirements for identity. The ID verification is just a yes, no confirmation, so there's no data that is shared. Uh, you, if you want to share data about yourself to open a bank account, you have to authorize it. So there's a whole host of things designed to actually make it a liberating thing and not a, not a constricting thing. And that's something, you know, if you see the design deeply, you, I think it, that comes through. Thanks for that uh, wonderful oration, Nandan. As you would know that uh, many people in India have multiple names. For example, my father, in his birth certificate, he his, has his name in Tamil, right? And Sorry? My father has, his, in his birth certificate, his name is in Tamil. It Tamil. Is, there is no translation to it. And in his college certificate, it's in English, without his initials. And his passport, he's got his first name and his last name, right? And in theory, uh, he could have an ID, a name in Aadhaar. He could have a different name in the National Population Register. And he could have a different name in his PAN card. H how are these, these sort of issues going to be solved? Or is there any correlation between the different uh, national databases? No, I mean, at, at, at a given point, yes, your name could be indifferent. But as you use the Aadhaar, know your customer attributes, that would start becoming the single source of truth. But that will take many years to happen. So let's say that you, you, you have your Aadhaar with a certain name and address. Then when you go to open a bank account, you can do an electronic KYC using your Aadhaar, and then you can say this supersedes the way the address or name is in your database, so that becomes common. Or if you open a passport. So you can, over time, you, you can use this to essentially standardize your name and address. But it'll take years, because you'll have to do it in every system. Uh, thank you and welcome. Welcome. Um, may I just have one question? That is, who attests in the theme of knowing your customer? I'm sorry. In in the theme of knowing your customer, who actually attests to the name that I am applying to myself, or is that not taken? Oh, you into mean account? when you enrol into the system? Yes. Can I be an acker, also known as, or do I? Can I? choose to be 
anyone I cho choose to be at that particular time. Yeah, well, you, you don't have, I mean, you, 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 whatever name you enroll with. Now, first of all, we have a certain process for enrollment where uh, if you already have a document of some kind, we, we recognize you can bring the document to show your name. But we also remember that we have to deal with a large number of people who don't have any document at all. And for them, we have a concept called the introducer. So uh, we have uh, acknowledged people who are called introducers. So the introducer says, I know this person, and that's his or her name. And that's how people who don't have an ID get an ID. That's the whole social inclusion bit. Mr. Nilkani, thank you very much for helping me understand the difference between a platform and an application. And as you said, thank this you. is a platform which will establish somebody's identity. And I think that's a great contribution to you know, social progress in India. I'm just wondering, will it be also with the Aadhaar card be also available to foreigners living in India and also non-resident Indians you know, who go to India who are Indian citizens but don't live in India? Well, this is a unique ID for residents of India. So this number is not a citizenship ID. And uh, having this ID does not confer any citizenship or anything on you. That is still the responsibility of the appropriate authority to establish the citizenship. Uh, so at this point, it's for residents, and any resident of India can apply for this number. Uh, the currently non-resident Indians are not well eligible in some sense for this number, but the law that is being considered in Parliament at this moment provides for the government to notify additional categories of people who can apply for the number. So I'm sure at some point that would be something the government could do as a regulation. So I'm curious to know how you measure your success. Is it solely on the basis of uh, whether you've achieved um, the technical um, outcomes? Or is it also, for example, on the basis of, of user adoption? And if, it, if, it, if, if that's part of your goal, user adoption, um, and of course the other um, government agencies taking up your, your, your platform, just from a user adoption perspective, what is, the, what is your value proposition to particularly those um, who um, are subliterate? And I can, I can certainly imagine how um, the middle class would, would flock to this and, and see the benefit of it. Of it. But if, if I'm, I'm in some rural, um, remote part of India and I've never had any need for, for literacy, how do, you, how do you sell me on this? Or is that not part of your goal? Well, uh, I mean, there are multiple measures of success. I mean, obviously, the first rudimentary measure was how many people have the number. To us, that was a measure. And, we had set the goal that we'll have 600 million people by 2014, and we are on target on, on that goal. The second was the usage of the number, and uh, the fact is that we have done about 10 million transactions uh, to about five to six million people where cash has gone electronically into the bank accounts. So increasing the number of people who actually get a benefit like that is, is another goal. We don't have a specific number on that. So we believe that uh, so these have been our short, I mean, at least in the first five years, that's been our measure of success. But over time, as you rightly said, the success has to be a little more nuanced in terms of engagement and so on. On your question about, uh, uh, in fact, the, the, our biggest demand is actually from the people who are disenfranchised, because uh, they are the ones who feel the need for identity the most. They are the ones who are being denied services because they can't prove who they are. They are the ones who are able to now use this to travel securely, to get a bank account, to get an LPG connection, to get a mobile connection. So on the contrary, just by word of mouth and, and, and this thing, it, it's got a huge buzz. And our enrollment centers are really running at full capacity because all the people see that they're not, they're not able to fully comprehend what exactly this is going to mean, but they know this is a gateway to the future. So we haven't had any challenge at all in, in uh, getting a huge, that's why we get one million people a day to enroll. First of all, actually, um, uh, it's very useful to listen to you to learn of the progress on, on uh, the Aadhaar project. And, and certainly, you know, it's a huge achievement of what seems to have been done over the last uh, four, four and a half years or five years. Uh, my question is the following. I mean, it's, um, and I think you, you made the distinction which others pointed out too in terms of a platform versus applications. And I think that's, a, uh, is eminently sensible to, to make that distinction and to begin with the platform, which itself is like a task of 
enormous, huge proportions, and you're well on your way to achieving that, which is great. The, the question is the following, and it's partly a technology question as well, that if the, the vision for the future is that all these different applications can be tied to this platform, and platform actually facilitates the applications, various applications. Now, consider any single application. What it requires, in a sense, is to link the database of the unique ID with another database. Say, for instance, the land record system. Somebody's got to do the measurement of the land. Or it might be PDS or something. You know, somebody's got to do. So there's another database to be linked to this. And the issue is that you know, while you've got this, and it's not a criticism, it's just a question. Uh, it, it, while you've got a, seems like a great system for biometric identification of the ID part of it, as these applications, other applications come, you've got to have a foolproof system for verifying these other sub data subsystems, if I may put it that way. And, and I'm wondering you know, whether your mandate or the mandate of Unique Identification Authority of India is already thinking a little bit ahead and saying that that's the next challenge coming up for us. We've got to establish a verification system for these other subsystems of data which are going to get linked to this. Because that's where issues of accountability, corruption can creep in unless you have a good system. And so I'm just wondering whether you're thinking sure. along those lines. Yeah. No, I think, you know, obviously the, 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 the mandate of the UID or the this architecture does not get into the business rules of the system, right? So, if the PDS system, you know, who gets how much at what price is, is, is entirely in the domain of the PDS system. But if the PDS system decides to use the Aadhaar number, what they would do is they would make sure that every beneficiary in the PDS system, they, they will seek the Aadhaar number. And that in itself will make housekeeping of that database to make sure there are only genuine people in that database.